Becky Cooper is an award-winning writer and cartographer, born and raised in Queens. She recently graduated from Harvard University with a degree in comparative literature. She's the creator of the website mapyourmemories.com and the author of Mapping Manhattan, which is the, our topic for today. Armed with hundreds of blank maps she had painstakingly printed by hand, Becky walked Manhattan from end to end, and along her journey, she met police officers, homeless people, fashion models, senior citizens, and many others who had lived in Manhattan all their lives. She asked the strangers to map, quote, map their Manhattan, and today she's joined by an illustrious panel of some of those mappers, and she will introduce them to you. I wanted to let you know that Becky's wonderful book, Mapping Manhattan, right here, is available for purchase, and if you'd like to look at it after and purchase it, Becky and some of the panelists will be happy to sign it, and it is for, um, for sale right over there in the corner, so on your way out, you can take a look um, and bring it there for Becky to sign. So um, thank you for coming. Please wel join me in welcoming Becky Cooper and her very special guests. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm just going to raise this up just a little bit. Um, we are joined here in order to talk about this book. Let's wait for my computer. This book, Mapping Manhattan, A Love and Sometimes Hate Story in Maps by 75 New Yorkers. As Debbie mentioned, I'm Becky Cooper. And these are the maps inside the book, these personalized images of Manhattan as imagined by New Yorkers I met walking down Broadway and by New Yorkers who I specifically reached out to because of the way that their Manhattan um, would enrich the volume. And so we're joined here today by Adam Gopnik, my mentor in so many ways. A New Yorker staff writer and the author most recently of The Table Comes First and Winter. And Patty Marks, also a New Yorker staff writer. And that is her map behind us right now. Uh, Brian Hughes, who is not here yet, but it's his birthday, so we'll forgive him. He is the Director of Protective Services at the Intrepid and was a police lieutenant before that and responded to the call on September 11th and worked on the site there for six months after. And Matt Green. who's a former civil engineer and who previously has walked across the country by foot and he is now in the middle of his three-year quest to walk all of the blocks in New York City. Um, but before we get to their stories about their New Yorks, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the story of mapping Manhattan itself. So it began for me the summer after my freshman year at Harvard uh, when I got a job working for the New York nonprofit Culture Now. And Culture Now started the summer after, or I guess right after September 11th, in order to encourage businesses to stay downtown um, and tourism to go there. And so they mapped all of the public art in downtown Manhattan, including the love sculpture and the subway mosaics. In the summer that I got the job, I was meant to write the copy for all of the map, all of the art for the map of all of Manhattan, so not just downtown. But when I got to my job the first day, I asked her when I could start writing the copy for the map. And, and she said, well, you can start writing it as soon as the map is done. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? And so she takes me over to the computer, and she uh, opens up the file on Illustrator. And the file is huge. And as soon as it opens, it self-destructs. And she kind of looks at me, and she's like, well, uh, you can start writing as soon as that's done. Um, and I, you know, it was a challenge, so why not? So I started making a map filled with 1,500 pieces of artwork. And she gave me three parameters for this map. She wanted it to be as beautiful as a poster. She wanted it to be very, very thorough. So she wanted all the information about all the art, including the provenance and cross-reference and color code and all these things. And she also wanted it to show Manhattan to scale. And she used as her counterexample the subway map of New York City, which is the map that I see every day of New York and is, for me, New York City. Um, and I think for many people. But it's a very, very distorted map. I mean, Staten Island is the, the Alaska of the map. Um, and Manhattan is distorted in many ways. It's not just squished and, and stretched, but it's also s distorted disproportionately along its length. 
And the New York Times ran a really interesting infographic a few years ago when the map was redone. And they focused on the way that Manhattan changed over time. So this is Manhattan in the current iteration of the map. And this is how it's changed. From 1939 to 1959, from 1972 to 2010. And those numbers underneath are the height to width ratios. The actual height to width ratio of Manhattan is that. Um, and it's not wrong, but every map is selective. Every map is a filter. Every map tells its own story either or both of its map maker and of its purpose. Um, and I came to realize that too, because even though I was making this map that was full of information, I was still making subjective decisions about what public art was, whether the art, um, or whether a carousel counts as art, or whether the art in public schools is public. And so this map, even as much information as was on it, was still a reflection of me and what my vision of public art was at the time. And that realization coupled with these napkins that had piled up on my desk, um, just little schematic drawings of where I was in the office and where I was going that night. Um, I realized that those napkins told an interesting story of my life in the city that summer. And because a city for me is the way it allows its inhabitants to live within it, it told an interesting story of Manhattan itself. Um, and echoed and echoing in the back of my brain was Invisible Cities by Atel Calvino, which is a conversation between the Venetian explorer Marco Polo and Kublai Khan. And it's a series of beautiful portraits. And at the very end of the book, Kublai Khan asks Marco Polo, you know, you've told me about all of these beautiful cities. Why have you never told me about your home, Venice? And Marco Polo looks at him and he goes, what do you think I've been doing this whole time? Um, because you can look at that in one of two ways. One is that every city that you see, no matter how far you go, is always seen through the lens of your home. Or it could be literally that each of these portraits of these cities was Venice itself, just from different points of view. And the re realization that these tiny little maps that I had made, even if they were my perspective exclusively, were really honest portraits themselves of Manhattan, captured me in a way that this map, that giant map of Manhattan didn't. And I was moved to start an art project where instead of having one maker, map maker, me, make this giant map, I wanted to distribute the role of the cartographer to as many people as possible and limit the canvas and to celebrate the subjectivity of the map maker that even if you try to cram all this information on, you're not gonna get rid of anyway. Um, and so with my friend Dan Ashwood, I designed the most schematic map of, of Manhattan possible, or not possible, but you know, it's, it's pretty schematic. It has Broadway just down the, the center, Houston that runs as the transverse in Central Park, and with those, and it also has Roosevelt Island, um, and with those three things, you could triangulate almost any location in Manhattan. And on the back of those maps, I had my, the address for my PO box, a couple of semi-poetic instructions that you'll hear, hear later, and you just, like a tape here thing, so that you would fold it in half and put it in the post when it was done. You just added a stamp. And then I letterpress printed these maps, because I wanted, more than anything, for people when they got these blank maps, to stop and to reflect on their experience in the city. Because if a map is a filter, you need to figure out what the essence is and what's not necessary. So letterpress printing, holding something that made you stop and think, um, was my goal. So these are the photopolymer plates. Each map, each sheet of paper had to pass through three times. And you can see a little, I don't know if you guys remember Mr. Rogers' picture picture, but this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I think of. You get to see the time change. flip it to do the back of the map, then you wipe off the ink, and you do the graph paper pattern. And this was in the basement of my college dorm where Patty and I actually both lived. Um, there was a vending machine and laundry machine and then a letter press. Um, <laughs> um, and after all of those maps were printed, you cut them up, you folded them, and then we, I made them into these little packages that took so long to make. But I wanted to hide them in the city because I wanted to turn Manhattan into a scavenger hunt. Because if Manhattan sort of caught you by surprise when you found this map, maybe you would catch it by surprise when you mapped it. 
And so I wrote, you found it, and I tucked it into Catcher in the Rye in Union Square, or into the bathroom at the Waldorf, or into the back of taxis. And none of them came back. <laughs> um, except for one. This one I had hidden on the High Line on a bench. And this woman, it's, it's a little hard to read with the contrast, but it says, you were holding my hand and looking at me with those beautiful big eyes of yours, and there was only us, and I knew my love for you was without measure, without punctuation, and with all my being. Except that one actually didn't come back either, because that was a present to her girlfriend, and she said she couldn't part with it, so she just scanned it and emailed it to me. Um, so something needed to change if I really wanted to get these maps back. And one day when I was trying to hide a map in a Lower East Side store, the store owner caught me and she asked me about the project. And I had this really wonderful conversation with her. Um, and I shared the story of the project and she shared the story or one of the stories of her in New York. And she sent her map back in two weeks later. And I realized that it was in that interaction with people that they were invested in the project as much as I was invested in them. And so I set out with a box of maps under my arm and my sneakers and my backpack and started all the way uptown in Marble Hill, which is the part of Manhattan that's actually connected to the mainland. And then you have Broadway, that bridge, um, and you, these are all of the neighborhoods that you pass by as you walk down Broadway. So you go from Inwood all the way 13.6 miles down, Matt will know this very well, to the Battery. Um, because I wanted to go down the street, Broadway is the only avenue that cuts all the way north-south in, in Manhattan. Um, it also is based on an old Native American trail, um, and it was also one of the main roads even back in the day. So it, it's a very deeply meaningful street in Manhattan, and so that was the street that I wanted to walk down. And it also cuts through many, many, many different neighborhoods, um, because I didn't just want to give maps to one current of New Yorkers. Um, but the best part about handing out these maps was that slight change in people's eyes from that utter skepticism of like, get away from me, why are you coming up to me on the street, to confusion. If I could get them confused, I'd buy myself 15 seconds. Um, and then I'd show them the stamp on the back of the map, and then I really had them because they were like, you're giving me a stamp. And so, <laughs> um, and so there's a little, I did the, the walk a bunch of times, but one time I did it with my friend Lily Erlinger, who's this wonderful filmmaker. And we filmed the reactions and cut it into a little trailer. And, and just look at people's eyes. I'm Becky Cooper. I'm the author of Mapping Manhattan, the book based on my art project, Map Your Memories. This is its story. Hi, I'm doing a public art project where I'm giving out blank maps of Manhattan and I'm asking people to fill it in with whatever makes this place special to them. I'm living in New York 72 years. I know <laughs> Manhattan back and forth. <laughs> I gave out thousands of blank maps of Manhattan with those instructions. Each map had a stamp and a P.O. box number printed on the back. Mapping Manhattan is a collection of 75 of those maps, depicting 75 different New Yorks. Does it have to be one thing or all the things that we think are important? See, maps are more about their makers than the places they describe. Map where you are. Map who you are. Map the invisible. Map the obvious. Map your memories. And the maps did come back. After those marathon walks, they came back and they were more diverse and more vulnerable and more candid than I had ever guessed. Some of them mapped Manhattan in pools of fear and relief. Some of them mapped where uh, she earned her PhD and where she earned the tuition to earn her PhD at nude strip clubs and BDSM dungeons and escort agencies. Um, some of them were really funny. They mapped heaven, Ireland, and Hell's Kitchen. Um, and some of them really took to heart the fact that a map is a filter and only labeled where they met their wife. Um, and when I wanted to turn these series of maps into a book, I wanted to do three things. I wanted more than anything to have you walk down Manhattan with me because I realized that as I walked down Broadway, the stories that I got, the people that I met, and the way that New York's history crept through in the buildings and the streets and everything was as much an honest and beautiful portrait of Manhattan as any of the maps that came back. 
And so I was careful to incorporate a narrative that blended New York history with the anecdotes of the people I met. And then I also had my illustrator friend, Bonnie Bryant, draw these beautiful little black and white sketches that would plant you into Broadway, wherever we were. Um, and then I also asked notable New Yorkers, some of them are gathered here, to add their maps to the collection. So of the 75, about 20 are from notable New Yorkers. So they are labeled on the side. So as you're going through the book, you can see, oh, this one is done by Philippe Petit. And I tried, especially in the spreads where it was an illustration and some narrative and some maps, to have there be a resonance between all of them. Um, and so I'll give you an idea of that by reading this text. Um, Cedar Street, 6.10 PM. The names of the streets here tell stories of New York's past. When Canal Street was a canal, Wall Street a wall, cedar and pine and beaver resources that filled the island. Pearl Street predates British days. The name comes from when Dutch merchants gorged themselves on the abundant oysters in the waters around the city. Maiden Lane tells of the young women who washed their clothes at the brook that lay at the end of the street. This is the land of New Amsterdam. Manhattan before the grid, when buildings were laid out to match the old Dutch farms back home. The land just off to the west on Day Street will, of course, be forever linked to New York history. But even before the smoke and the tears and the unfathomable loss, before the great aerialist Philippe Petit dared onlookers to dream as he tight walked a tightrope between the twin towers, sorry, the land was already inseparable from Manhattan's past. It was waterfront. It was where the Dutch explorer Adrian Block docked his ship, the Tiger, after his long transatlantic voyage in 1614. And it was where that ship burned down soon after. But Block, with the help of the native Lenape, did not let that step up, setback stop him. He set up camp on the island and built his new ship from the remains of the Tiger. When Block eventually returned into the Netherlands, he brought with him a detailed new map of the territory, the first to show Manhattan as an island, and abundant beaver pelts. With these in hand, he helped galvanize the reluctant Dutch to start colonizing New Amsterdam. In 1967, Dutch cannons, possibly, possibly belonging to the Tiger, were recovered when the foundation of the World Trade Center was being laid. Rebirth is deep in the soil of the area. Um, in addition to Philippe Petit and Patty Marks and Matt Green, I also reached out to Yoko Ono. Um, and that was one of my favorite stories of a uh, contributor because I never really would have dared to ask her. I don't know her at all. But I was uh, taking a friend on a tour of Central Park and doing the sort of typical New York thing as we were passing on the west side, saying this is the Dakota, this is where John Lennon was shot, and I think Yoko Ono still lives there. And my friend who is from out of town says, oh, she does. I was like, well, how do you know? And he said, well, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine saw Yoko Ono in front of the Dakota. And he runs up to her, and he takes a piece of paper out of his bag. And he says, Miss Ono, will you sign this? And she takes the piece of paper, and she rips it in half. And she hands half back to him. And she says, if you meet me back here in 10 years, I'll rejoin the halves, and I'll sign the paper for you. And apparently, my friend says, they changed, uh, exchanged letters for the next few years. And 10 years later, they met up in front of the Dakota. They rejoined the halves, and she signed it. <laughs> and I asked him what address the friend had used to talk to Yoko Ono, and he's like, I don't know, I'll, I'll go find it. Um, and he gives me the address, and I let my dad put the, the map in the mail. Um, and I write a little note that says, Dear Miss Ono. And a month later, I get an envelope back from the Dakota, and this letter that says, Dear Rebecca, thank you for the invitation to Yoko Ono to participate in your project, Map Your Memories. Ms. Ono has generously decided to participate and her offering is included in this envelope. Best of luck to you with your project, with a little picture of the Dakota at the bottom of the stationery. And it felt like the New York magic that I had felt walking down Broadway, where people who were busy going around their day would stop and sometimes thank me for the chance to reflect on their life in this city. Um, it was wonderful. The final map in the book is my map. Um, it's the way that I, it's my mental geography, which is to say that a place doesn't exist for me if it isn't emotionally pegged. I am always hopelessly lost because of that, because <laughs> there is just no negative space in my head. So I've, I've merged the park just under Stuyvesant where I went to high school with this street, West 4th Street, with a beautiful restaurant and then a sort of nondescript fire escape laced building, Central Park, 
the Brooklyn Bridge that somehow runs through it, um, and a Truman Capote quote about how New York is a myth uh, for anyone, everyone. And the book ends where Manhattan ends, at Battery Park, um, overlooking the Statue of Liberty. And I just wanted to read you the last paragraph of the introduction before we turn it over to our other participants. Um, it's taken me 20 years to realize I love this place, not just because I was born here. I take pictures of the reservoir in Central Park at sunset, even though I've run there 100 times before. My heart fills when I hear an older man at City Diner say, hey, Marion, have you tried the pies here yet? They're nice. I love the subway, the fleeting moments of connection, a glance with a stranger to acknowledge a rat on the tracks, the hand that goes out of its way to keep the door open for you. Even the gentle white noise of a train rumbling between stations is something I get as homesick for as for my mother's cooking. Maybe that one's just me. And yet there will always be something essentially elsewhere about New York. It is a place that people come to precisely because it doesn't ever fully offer itself. It's intoxicating, keeps you on your toes, keeps you drinking coffee, and keeps you walking. Part of, part of why I love New York so deeply is exactly this elusiveness. This refusal to be caught is what allows it to carry such fantasy, mystery, and myth, yet also be home. It is simultaneously no one's city and everyone's city. New York may always be just over there, but what you know is yours. And these tiny, invisible cities are what make up Manhattan. Thank you. And so now I'll turn it to Adam and Patty and Matt to talk about maps and meaning and their invisible cities in New York. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bec Becky. It's, um, it's wonderful to, to listen to you, wonderful to see this project now uh, fully assembled and organized and presented. You know, one of the things that's always struck me about the project and about the nature of, of mapping is to ask myself, would this be as successful, as poetic, as resonant, as evocative? in another city, in Paris or London, as it has been in New York? And I think on the whole, the answer is not. And I have a kind of theory about why it would not be. You know, it's not an accident that if you think about the most um, wonderfully witty artistic maps of any city, I think we think first of Saul Steinberg's maps of New York, the most famous one that New Yorker covered that showed the New Yorker's view of the world with 9th and 10th Avenues occupying 2 thirds of the space of the planet. And, California, distant vision beyond. Um, and if you think about it, why should that be? Well, one reason is, I think, is that New York is uniquely among great cities a willed artifact, a highly rationalized artifact. It's designed on a, on a grid that was dreamed up by planners uh, before there was anything to put on the grid. And you know, there's those wonderful uh, prints that you can still find of uh, uh, you know, 75th and Lexington, which just looks like rolling farmland, but it already had the name seven, East 75th and Lexington. So there's that element about New York of it being entirely rationalized, thought through in advance. As you probably, you may not remember, um, I originally I was going to call my book about New York, that eventually was called Through the Children's Gate, um, a map of New York, because I, the sort of metaphor for the book had come about when, in the course of doing some reporting, I had met a guy named Al, uh, Al Leidner who was making a map of New York for the city. And it was the first perfect map of New York that there had ever been. Well, what did that mean? It meant that all of the New Yorks that existed for the city of New York, for the government of New York itself, independently were being unified into one map. That is, the subway map, the Con Ed map, the uh, street map, all of those things, the uh, insurance map, were all going to be unified using computer graphics into one map. And it was the most magnificent undertaking you can imagine, because it wasn't just Manhattan, it was all of Queens, all of Brooklyn, all of the Bronx. And they had to actually employ fact checkers who would go to the, some of the really uh, kind of gnarly bits of the map to sort of figure out how everything interacted. And one of the part of the comedy of it was is that New York changes so much that they were constantly updating the map even as they attempted to finish it. So it was a permanently unfinished map. But it was a monument to a certain kind of rationality in a way that London is a much more organic growth. That's why we, it's so, you know, it takes two years for a taxi driver in London to be ready to drive his taxi because the system of mapping is completely irrational, historical, idiosyncratic to begin with. Same thing is very true of Paris. Paris, it's reflected 
in the names of the streets, the Rue de Chaki Pesh, the, the, the cat who sins and fishes. It's that kind of oddity is already built in. But New York's not like that. New York is Broadway. It's numbered streets. It's numbered avenues. And as a consequence, there's a certain, I think, kind of poignance about overlapping our own entirely eccentric, idiosyncratic, and highly personal uh, visions of the city and memories of the city onto something that we know was not uh, made by the accidents of individuals, but was made by the will of a central planner. And I think that back and forth in every sense between the, the rational universalized and the irrational and individual is one of the things that gives the maps their, their energy. And you know what, what else always strikes me about the, this mapping project is there are certain peculiar tasks that you give to people, certain peculiar predicaments that you give to people that don't, that they get instantly. They understand instantly what, what's being asked to them. You know, it's like in The Matrix, the, the, the movie. Nobody watching it has difficulty with the concept, oh, maybe our entire experience is a fictional construct put on our heads by a, a, a sinister power. Everyone says, oh, I understand that, I get that. They, they troubles with a lot of little details, but nobody says, huh, explain that to me again, I don't understand it, because it's one of our kind of root primal fears. And in the same way, I don't think anybody, there are people who didn't do it, but there was nobody who didn't understand it. Nobody who didn't understand that what you were asking them to do was to map their particular experience, their particular vision of New York onto the general map. It's as though we have a kind of built-in cognitive construct that says, make a map, make a map, construct your world around your emotions and rather than around your common experience. Patty and I have the, the, the blessing, it's a blessing for our family anyway, of living in the same building. We live a couple of floors away. And when we were leaving the house this morning to come down here, leaving the building, um, we were going to take the M86 across town. And I naturally headed towards Fifth Avenue. We live between Madison and Fifth to get the bus at the corner of Fifth and 86. And Patty's whole body recoiled in horror <laughs> at this attempt because, of course, when she gets the bus, she goes right down Madison. Can I add that we, we did walk an extra block. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, we gained an extra block in getting to the west side. <laughs> <laughs> and it was as deep a div biggest quarrel as we've had in many years of friendship because my map of Manhattan ran along as much as you know Mississippi pilots uh, knows where the shoals and the turns are and the thing we both had had two maps of how you get to the sea train that were at war with each other. And we suddenly looked at each other and said, this is so apropos of what we're going to do, Adam, right? And Adam, Adam is telling the story because he won. <laughs> <laughs> I won as, as a short Jewish men tend to win. That is by sheer acceleration, right? Before <laughs> we, could, we could move. So I think that the idea that we have, the idea of the individual map, the idea that inside our heads sits a map of our experience, far from being a, uh, an alien one is a deeply, if you ask people, orchestrate your experience of Manhattan. Only a tiny handful, I think, would say, oh, you mean like where do the oboes play and where do the strings play? That'd be a demanding thing. You'd get no cards back on that. But map your memories, everybody gets. I, I'm intrigued by your question about would it work for another city? I think it probably would, but N New York, I was thinking, a, everybody has an idea about New York. There are many people who came to New York with an idea. And it's also the right size for this project. Everybody can conceive of being in another, knows about other neighborhoods even if they haven't been there. It's not that vast, but it's not, people have their own New Yorks. If it was smaller, they might have the same New York. Yes, I think that's, I think that's so. But. You've actually, right, now how far along are you in the, in the Walk New York project? Uh, I'm not entirely sure because I don't know uh, the exact miles that I will walk by the end of it. Um, I've heard that there's somewhere between 6,000 and 6,400 miles of streets in New York City. Um, I'm also walking in, in parks and cemeteries and other big blocks of land. Um, and I end up you know, doubling up on a lot of streets. So I, I'm guessing that the total will be maybe nine or 10,000 miles. And I'm at, I just crossed 3,400. So that's after 15 months. So I have quite a ways to go. So it's taking you a longer time than it will take you to, when you walked across the country. Yeah, many, many times longer. Um, I'll probably walk three times the distance just within New York that I did from New York to Oregon. 
kind of gives you a sense of how mm -hmm. dense and how packed and everything exactly. is. Exactly. Well, that was what that, the map, Al Leidner's map of New York indicated was it wasn't the, it, it wasn't the extension. It was sort of like the intestines wrapped yeah, inside a body. It's, 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 go, it is when they say, you do you know that yeah, right. that little intestine would go to the moon and back? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, oh, sorry. I mean, how has walking all of those blocks changed your perception of New York City? Um, I guess it, I think what it's done is, is it's made me realize because New York, like you said, uh, is, is kind of this unknowable place. You know, we each have our own New Yorks, but, but there's no way to know the city as a whole. Um, and as a result, I think we tend to take this easy way out of, of buying into these stereotypes and these stories. You know, this neighborhood's this way, this neighborhood's this way, because, you know, there's no way we're going to have time to, to go visit all these places and decide if those things are right. Um, and those, those stereotypes and narratives paint this specific New York that I think exists in the background of a lot of people's minds. You know, they have their own particular New York on top of that. But there are a lot of these common stories that are out there that have come about, I think, based on very little fact and reality. Um, and, and what's really changed for me is just the understanding that any time I go to any neighborhood, it's going to be completely different than, than anything I've heard it is. Or it'll be the same in some ways and different in other ways, you know. You see, it's so easy to think of a neighborhood as, as dangerous or as ritzy or whatever, but you go there and you meet consecutive people on the street and they obviously do not all fall into those stereotypes. And it's a reminder that, you know, even in, even in a neighborhood that has certain characteristics, it's a vastly diverse place. And yet, yeah, I don't mean yet because I'm not contradicting you, but if you were to plop someone down on a street in New York, you usually have a pretty good sense of if you're on the Upper West Side or the East Side, it does, there is a look. There is a look. I mean, some of that is, is uh, you know, that's kind of encoded in the, the buildings and the physical structure of the but place, though. But, like, sometimes I live on the Upper East, Adam and I live on the Upper East Side, and sometimes I go downtown and I think, I would be so much cooler if I lived here. <laughs> and I think, I would be wearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Eating that. <laughs> Although, you know, the opposite side of that is it's always struck me, and it's become increasingly uh, more true in the 30 some years I've lived in New York or around New York, is that um, uh, is the New York fetish of neighborhood names for completely indistinguishable neighborhoods. You know, yeah. We live in Carnegie Hill, right? Yeah. We don't live in Yorkville. That's the first place mm -hmm. we live. Well, you could plop you down in Yorkville now has no Yorkfulness about it. Mm -hmm. And Carnegie Hill is very little Carnegie and no hilliness yeah. around it. And the same thing is true increasingly of Murray Hill, Kipps Bay, and yet the names reside in the neighborhoods that once were once were distinct. I do think, you know, that one of the things that, and now I get to use my favorite sentence, which I get to use at dinner time and rarely in the middle of the day. You kids are too young to remember. <laughs> but you kids are too young to remember the degree to which 30 or 35 years ago, when Patty and I first came to, uh, to New York, um, the safety map was the dominant map. It was the single most important map. That was knowing safe streets from unsafe streets, safe neighborhoods from unsafe neighborhoods and in an off, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I think it was in the Central Park Five documentary, which was precisely at a dangerous time in New York, took place at a dangerous time in New York. People would say, no matter how dangerous statistically your neighborhood was, if you, it's sort of like what we're saying, if you, the streets that you always walk down, you considered safe. That's right. And that was one of the things that you learned. That was one of the first maps you made in your head when, as a pilgrim, you arrived in New York, you were instructed by others about it. And that um, shaped and indeed warped your experience of New York uh, considerably. And I'm very struck that in the life of my own 18-year-old, um, for instance, that is not, that's a very remote map. It's a map that exists to some degree, but it exists sort of in the way that Al Leidner's map had many layers. That's on the stratification layer. That's a, a bottom layer. And it's a genuine transformation in the city. In the, past, in the past 30 years. I do feel, though, that, I mean, I, just from, from talking to other people about this project, that safety issue is one of the top questions that comes up. Like, really? what's it like walking around Brownsville, like East New York, these neighborhoods that I hear of that, that I never go to? And maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not questions particular. Questions from whom? I'm uh, surprised. Oh, from, from, uh, I mean, from almost not any. New Yorkers. From New Yorkers, yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, definitely. even just deciding what neighborhood to move into, because you're always sort of pushing the frontier of rent versus safety. Um, it's a question it's still, that no, comes up. No, no, it still comes up, but I don't, you, you kids are too young to remember. I get to say <laughs> it again. 
when it was the, when, you know, the, there are many layers of maps in our, our cognitive maps as well as our actual maps. And that was uh, a top layer that affected every, uh, every, everything else you did and affected what entrances to subway stations. You would have a little running map. I spent my early New York years not far from here, back in the early 80s in Soho and Tribeca. And I was just reading um, uh, Eric Fischel, a fine painter's memoir of the 70s and 80s around here. And he was remembering a, a woman, a friend of his, being stabbed 20 paces from where we are now at 8 o'clock in, in the evening. That was part of the, of, the, uh, of the undercurrent. It was part of the grid, so to speak. There's uh, been a geographic, geographic expansion of where, you, where your friends live. Y yes, your exactly. Your friends right. lived in a, in a dot, and now right. they live in a, in a bigger area. Our friends, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Our friends. It, it's dots. also just been interesting to me to think about how the grid itself has affected the culture of New York. Not just that, yes, when you move here, maybe one of the first things that you encoded in your brain was the safety map of New York. But even the first moment when you get here, it's not like Paris. You do have a mental map of New York because it is a grid. It, it's a city that isn't one that you have to spend three decades becoming an expert in. And I, I, I like thinking about what that does to the culture of a place where it is inclusive by its infrastructure. You know where you are because it's, you know, if you know two coordinates, you know as much as the next person over. Um, and figuring out how that's shaped the way that the city sort of welcomes in people and, and gives people a home, even if it's always just off, maybe because it's always becoming, because there's always people coming in, and maybe less so that it's a city of aspiration and ambition, which it also is in equal measure. Uh, I find it very comforting that it's numbered. Uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> um, but when I moved here, I grew up in Philadelphia, as did Adam, uh, for a little while. I stayed there. And New, York, and New York was just kind of, you live in the tent in Philadelphia and the house is, is New York. Uh, and I wanted, and we'd come on school trips. I came with my, I do have an answer to your question. I'm going to forget it. Well, Philadelphia um, is true, Patty. Philadelphia is uh, sort of the Gaza Strip yeah. of Jewish and middle class people, yeah, right? You we were would, there for. We, well, my, I remember taking a trip with my parents and walk, driving around in the station wagon when my father pointed out hippies. So that hippies are still in Greenwich Village to me. Um, and, uh, but I, when I moved here, it was just so big and I was lost. I mean, I'm geographically challenged anyway. I, to, to, know where, to know where West is, I have to put the map of the United States in my brain and say, California, it's on the me left. Too. <laughs> um, and when I moved to New York, I remember meeting someone on 2nd and 8th. And I thought, 2nd and 8th? Make up your mind. <laughs> that big. But once you grasp that, you're, you're fine as long as you know numbers. And that is a great, great thing about New York. <laughs> but even, even to this day, there are certain numbered streets that are mysterious to me. Fourth Avenue, right? I have a general sense yeah. of Fourth Avenue, yeah. but I don't have a good grasp of Fourth Avenue. Right. East First Street, East First Street, you know, similarly. Yeah. And you have to kind of, East First, not First Avenue. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're even within the grid, the, the, one of the beautiful things about the grid is that it takes on such strong, even though it's purely abstract and numerical, it takes on such strong synesthetic associations. Mm -hmm. So for me, the East 70s are always red. The East mm -hmm. 80s are always, Gold in the East Yellow in the East Nineties. That's your mental map. Are sort of <laughs> are sort of are sort of black. It's sort of and and I can't be in any of those neighborhoods without having those those uh, those very powerful uh, uh, turns and those very powerful uh, associations with them. The other thing I'd say, you know, I'm trying trying to think, and I do think though, as you expand the. Um, uh, mapping empire, yeah. I dare say, you will be called on to do mapping Paris, mapping London and so on, but I suspect that they will be less rewarding than this book is, less beautiful. And I do think the other thing is, is New York is hard. New York is just hard. And it remains hard even with all of the transformations that the city has, has undergone. And so there's an element, I think, in all of these maps, where I met my wife, where I walked, of, of uh, human tenderness hard-won from a very tough place. And I think that's the other thing that makes it 
uh, moving. I was on the subway the other day and I realized there was just this wonderful community of commiseration. I, I never <laughs> feel closer to my New Yorkers than when the subway is stuck in the middle of the, the tunnel and we're just looking at each other. <laughs> um, or I, I was rushing onto a train the other day and I, parents, I'm sorry, but I like jammed my arm in the door to try to, you know, get in and I like sort of wiggle my way in and I'm blocking the whole C train from moving and the C train takes, you know, like 20 minutes to come. So I really wanted to get on this train and I lock eyes with this woman across from me and I thought she was going to kill me. Yeah. And the only seat on the train is the one next to her and I'm on it for a while so I'm going to sit down right next to her. And I'm just like you know, trying to take up as little space as possible. And then she looks at me and she goes, honey, you are a girl after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's true, it's, it's those little tender moments of community or of uh, oneness that are particularly sweet in a city that's as kinetic and as sometimes impersonal as New York can be. I was just thinking of, again, of how uh, uh, connections and how geography just bewilders me. I'm, I'll like get up from the subway and go, which is 57th, which is Madison? And, and you just have to kind of figure out where north is. And I, a couple of years ago, I got up from the subway and I just said to somebody, could you just tell me which way north is? And he goes, if that's a pickup line, it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use it. <laughs> Well, what's you, your, if this is a pickup line, I wouldn't have asked you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Matt, what's your, uh, what's your number one discovery? What part of the city that you've walked in would you recommend walking in that, we, that uh, on the whole people tend to think of less uh, for walking purposes? Sure, sure. Uh, I, uh, people often ask you know, uh, that or some kind of version of that question, which I always have this unsatisfying, thank you elusive for, answer Thank you for praising the <laughs> originality of their demand. <laughs> Well, usually it's, it's, you know, what block should I walk right. if I'm going to walk one block? But, um, <laughs> but, but, but what, I've, what I've realized in walking so much is that the experience of, of walking through a place is only tied in part to the place where you are. A lot of it is the weather, the mood you're in, the people who are around you. And so my answer to that question is always, you know, my, my favorite street is a street where it's 72 degrees and sunny and there's a guy giving away ice cream and, you know, a cute girl smiles at me walking down the street. Um, but, but what I've realized that, is I think that street is in Cincinnati the last time <laughs> I checked. I've never been on that street in New York with the... It's in, it's in Brownsville, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it, it showed me that, that, you know, you really don't have to try very hard to to have a really interesting experience in New York. I mean, literally every, every day that I go out walking, uh, you know, I take a lot of photos and that's kind of how I, I document what I'm doing and it's also kind of my notes for, for what to research and learn about later. Um, so some days I have fewer photos than others, but, but there's never, ever once been a boring day. Um, and I think it just has to do with, with opening yourself up to the realization that New York is this gigantic city. Every, every neighborhood here has thousands and thousands of people living there and they're, characteristics and their personalities kind of spill out in all sorts of different ways that are visible to you, whether it's, you know, the way they decorate their yard, signs they put up, the way they communicate with their neighbors. Um, and so I, I think rather than, you know, my, my walk kind of, I guess, in a sense, turns the, the, the typical, like, uh, tour guide mentality on its head, whereas instead of deciding what's interesting and then going to see it, you just go to a place and find out what's interesting there. And that also personalizes it a lot because I'm seeing just whatever catches my eye, especially because I use this, the photographic documentation. It's just literally what catches my eye is what I remember, and that's what I later go home and I read about on the computer and I find out what it is that I saw, and that, that applies just everywhere throughout the city. Did you have a goal starting, like a, a sort of higher order desire to fulfill in starting this project? Uh, I don't think that I had one. I mean, I think it's just some kind of deep-rooted insanity or something um, <laughs> that, you know, manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, so, no, I, there wasn't one really driving factor. Um, I, uh, I mean, what, one, one thing was I just wanted to learn how much I didn't know about New York. Um, and, you, you know, New York is a great place to be a know-it-all. And, you know, I, I read this in The New Yorker, you know, I saw... Um, and, and to kind of pull those stories out and, and impress people at dinner parties. But, but uh, I, I kind of was, was tired of being that way, I guess, and, and wanted to show myself how little I actually knew. I, okay. I did a piece I just remembered for a travel magazine with my friend Roz Chest, who's a cartoonist, 
on 29th Street as if it were a country. We went from the east to west, and it was amazing how different it was. Yeah. It ends in Bellevue, which was great. <laughs> Can I ask you something, Bex? Becky, yeah. have you had a Brooklyn backlash to the book? Because oh, one of the things that strikes me, I mean, you're, a, you're, you're an Outerboro girl who then became a Manhattanite, who then became a Brooklynite, which seems to be the, 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 the mechanism of your generation. And when Patty and I first came to the city, boy, do I sound, make us sound yeah, like a couple of, sound like Walter <laughs> Brennan and, and Mom's Maple. Remember, the, remember the cows <laughs> yes, in the village? Grazing <laughs> on Sheep's Meadow. We used to milk them yeah, every night <laughs> for the. And then that was before they had milk. Well, we, we were there when they discovered milk. <laughs> no, that's right. That's you right. were the Dairy Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had that, though? Because the, one of the s single most startling and striking things about my own experience of, of New York has been that there was this great, it's like the whole vacuum cleaner of New York got put on reverse. You know, the way you did that as a child, right? You'd put the thing on reverse, so it would blow instead of sucking. And that great suction action that drew people from Brooklyn and Queens into Manhattan for 100 years has now been switched in the reverse, and it blows people out of Manhattan into the other boroughs, particularly in Brooklyn particularly. So again, my 18-year-old, um, Williamsburg is the holy name and his map of Manhattan, right? It's where you dream of going if you could only escape the Upper East Side and the <laughs> Greenwich Village, Soho, all of those um, benumbed suburban uh, areas and you could eventually get to Bedford-Stuyvesant. So have you heard that from people? People saying that, that they wished you had put Brooklyn on the map? Uh, sometimes. I, I've gotten a lot of, I would love to do Brooklyn next. I mean, I, I remember uh -huh. when uh, friends would joke when I was moving back from college, they were like, what, what city are you moving to, Manhattan, Brooklyn, or Queens? Mm. Um, but uh, I think there's this desire for Brooklyn to be next, but there is an understanding both aesthetically, as, as Patty mentioned, of Manhattan being the right scale for this project, both in terms of geography, but also in terms of just handing out these maps, like trying to figure out what the post office would consider a letter was sort of a Sisyphean task. But um, the, the idea that, that Brooklyn could be a separate entity um, was one that understood that Manhattan is a mythic place mm -hmm. for people even outside of people who have never been there also, as Patty mentioned have some idea of what Manhattan is um, in a way that allows it to, to stand alone. Yeah, because it is like a grid. It's like a trap for catching, for, for catching things. It has, it's, like a, it's like a cage in that way. And, and as you mentioned, I, I really liked playing off of the grid of Manhattan as a place to then sort of plant your own personal life within it, which is why I, I sort of passed the map in one more time to get that, that uh, graph paper pattern because I wanted to play with this idea of this imposed uh, grid to then Which sort of you, be the You can't really do with Brooklyn because everything in Brooklyn is sort of somewhere in Brooklyn, right? right. <laughs> not, mm -hmm. not, not right. The it was, it was m a more defiant ig uh, ignoring of geographic location if you could chart out where you were doing it but decided like a, the map of the homunculus to map it as though you had experienced it even, even though mapping it technically accurately was an option. Do you, do you know an interesting thing? I noticed, in, in, of course, in, in looking through the book, that um, Central Park plays a, a large role. It was extremely ingenious to put Central Park in as that oblong, because everybody orients around Central Park. But a funny thing, as you know, is that when um, Olmsted and was designing Central Park, he wanted it to be, so to speak, spiritually, emotionally off the grid. And one of the things that he fought in the, in the years when they were designing Central Park was the attempts of a lot of people, especially more conventionally minded designers and rich people, to give Central Park a uh, horizontal vertical unity that would mimic or resemble the rest of the city. One of the things that he fought again and again was having a grand allee that would run from one end of the park to another and give it a kind of spine. We, it, it persists a bit around uh, in the, uh, the, 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 the poet's walk, what do we call it? You know, the mall? The mall. But the mall is off is off uh, center, it's akimbo to the rest of it. And one of the key experiences I've always thought about New York that makes it interesting is, is that you get lost in Central Park so easily. I, you know, I've been walking in Central Park every day for 25 years and my sense of direction, true, is even worse than Patty's, but I have a hard time with um, 
you know, finding the, our block most nights coming home. But I, I think that that was a real insight on Olmsted's part. That is that the gridded city needed an, a non-gridded alternative as a means of escape. Yeah, no, the, the three things that I marked on the grid actually mark the things that aren't on the grid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Broadway was never meant to, it wasn't included, in, it was 1811 John Randall's plan that changed Manhattan into a grid, and Broadway wasn't on it, but it just wouldn't go away. Um, and so I, I put that on the map. And then Central Park is the thing that resists the grid. Um, and then Houston is where, even though the grid doesn't really start in earnest until 14th Street, Houston is where it actually starts. Um, so those were the three. It's sort of like uh, in computer science, you, you use as little information as possible. You map the chaos in order to map everything. Um, so I mapped the chaos in Manhattan in order for people to be able to triangulate. Mm, that's All true. Right. Should we? Turn over to questions now. I, Debbie is going to be walking around with a microphone, and we have about 10 minutes for questions if you guys have any. Uh, do, you, do you have a day job? And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and that is not a pickoff question. <laughs> and, and, and how about yourself? Are you principally on a, a bookstore? Um, do you want to answer first? Sure. I do not have a day job. I walk all day and I, I uh, just research things that I saw and I um, put them on my blog and blog. yeah mm -hmm. blog? it's I'm just walking dot com uh, I, I tell you kids today yeah. kids today <laughs> I want to be a kid today I'm just walking dot com map your memories <laughs> dot com I mean did we do that we were well I have to say for a long time I, I was sort of looking for a job and my brother who's four years younger someone said what do you want to do when you grow up and he's Whatever she does looks pretty good. <laughs> um, and I, I work at my neighborhood cafe as a barista uh, at Ted and Honey, and I love that job so much because really what it is is it's the cafe I would hang out in anyway, but I'm getting paid, and I get to just hear people's stories all day long. It, it's like giving out maps. You know, I give them a cup of coffee, and I get you know five stories in exchange, and it's wonderful. I majored in comparative literature, and I had a minor in mind, brain, and behavior, so I majored in indecision. <laughs> I'm, I majored in the very practical subject of civil engineering, which my parents were thrilled with for about five years till I quit. Uh, could you ever leave New York? Do you ever see yourself being able to live somewhere else? I could, but I wouldn't. Um, no, I, I love New York. New York, I mean, I was saying to somebody yesterday, you don't even have to have friends if you live in New York. <laughs> you, you know, you really don't. I mean, there's stuff to do. You can, you look, you sort of walk and you look as if you have friends. If you're, <laughs> and, and I would, if I had got a great job, I would l move. But I think in my mind, I would think it was temporary. Um, I did leave New York for several years. I went to live in Paris with my family, and we had a wonderful time. And I would, I guess I would, I still have plans, my wife and I have plans, as Becky knows, to retire to Paris, where we'll be an old couple, and I'll wear a three-piece suit and have an irascible little dog um, <laughs> in that way. But for the moment, I can't imagine our, my friend David Remnick, the editor of New Yorker, says Remnick's first rule of life is there's never really a good reason to leave New York. He's a New Jersey boy. But whenever you're on, on your way out on a book tour or something, so, you know, there's never really a good reason to leave New York. And on the whole, I think that's true. Um, uh, my wife um, has this thing about um, uh, grass and flowers and so on and all of that. So she has, a, a, you know, a somewhat pornographic yearnings for Connecticut. But generally, <laughs> generally, if you can walk her around Central Park for 20 minutes or so and they dissipate. <laughs> I love New York in the summer weekend, especially where yeah. we live. You just want to buy no a car to park it. That's if right. There's no <laughs> one in the streets. Um, <laughs> I, I also moved to Paris last year and, and have run quickly back. Uh, although I do, I would like to live somewhere else um, for a while because I do feel like I want to end up here. Um, and I don't feel like I'm ready to end up 
here yet because I haven't yet experienced something else. No, that you, I no you wouldn't really, pe really, Becky. You wouldn't want to live someplace else. You know. I mean, I know you've no. lived here your whole life, <laughs> but then you'll go to. I just, I just want to miss New York a lot. <laughs> that you'll back. do, and then you'll find little bits of other cities that are sort of like New York, and you'll be so deeply grateful that you know that that you've had it. I think the thing we tend to underestimate is as New Yorkers, and it's what makes us insufferable and arrogant and essential, is how different life is in New York from every other part of America. That is that, you know, the way that, uh, just car life, the way that you're not dependent on, on cars. For neither those of, of us, us drive. <laughs> beg pardon? Neither of us drive. No, neither, no, neither Becky or I. At some point we're gonna teach each other how to drive, but for the moment, <laughs> We, we don't, and I suffer from acute motion sickness, so, you know, where else can you be? I think all, another thing that makes us obnoxious is that, uh, two things. One is, we think everyone wants to live in New York, yes. and most people who don't live, live yeah. here don't want to. And we think, and I think um, we're right, everywhere but New York is very provincial. When I moved to New York, and then I visited home in Philadelphia, and I was so obnoxious, it was like two or three in the morning ago, why can't we go get a pizza? In New York, we can get a pizza. In New York, we can do this. And something if, about the... If I may, that's why they invented the concept of provincial, right? Because yeah. there was a center, right. and then there were the provinces, mm -hmm. right? So it's not derogatory. It's merely right. descriptive. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> but Matt, do you, do you plan on staying in New York after you finish walking? I've, uh, kind of my relationship with New York's been a little bit interesting. I grew up in a small town in Virginia, and... I hated going into the city. I hated going to Richmond, you know, the capital of Virginia. Um, and I kind of ended up here because of a girl many years ago and ended up loving it here, obviously. Um, but, but what was interesting is when I, when I left New York to, to do my walk across the country, you know, as soon as I was out of New York and I was in these other little towns, I was thinking, why on earth would I ever go back to New York? Like, these places are so wonderful. And I finish the walk and I get back to New York and I think, why on earth would I have left New York? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's, I think, at least in my head, there's a, an easy way to love wherever you are. Um, and yeah, if so you, I, could, I could definitely leave New York, but I'm, I'm happy not to also. You know, someone once said, I think that um, a skunk is not a worse smell than other smells. It just is more smell than any other smell. And I've always felt that way about New York. New York is not a better city than other cities, but it's just sort of more city than any other city. And if you like cities, you're sort of stuck being addicted to New York because it's just more city, more of the essential urban experience transpires here than anywhere else I know. Time for one more question. One last question. Go in the back. Yeah. I've never known anybody to walk across the United States. Um, could you just Tell us how you, did you go north, south? Uh? Sure, I, uh, I left from Rockaway Beach in Queens and walked to Rockaway Beach, Oregon, um, which is, I didn't know that that place in Oregon existed, I just knew I was gonna leave from Rockaway Beach in Queens and I was trying to figure out where to go and like Los Angeles seemed too cliched so I was looking at a map of Oregon and I found there was a Rockaway Beach there. Um, so I, I kept a pretty northerly route and um, I had a, a ridiculous looking jogging stroller that I pushed with my stuff in it, I had a tent in it and you know, clothing and a little bit of food and uh, I would just walk and walk and it would start to get dark and I'd go knock on people's houses, knock on people's doors and say, can I put my tent up in your yard tonight? And 75% uh, of America said yes and they would invite me in for dinner and you know, let me take a shower, which was of course to their benefit as well since I was gonna be having dinner with them. Uh, let me do my laundry. Uh, it was just an extraordinary outpouring of, of generosity from, from people of all walks of life, people who, uh, you know, later on when, when we were having dinner, they would say things that were, that were offensive to me, maybe to my political beliefs, but, um, and they, they were the kind of people that, that in New York, it's easy to sit here and say, that's what's wrong with, that's what's wrong with the world, but when this person, you know, takes you a, a total stranger off the street and puts you up in their house, it's, yeah, it makes you quick to realize how, how little a lot of those differences really mean. Um, so it was an incredibly positive experience, and, and I've, I've talked to a lot of other people who've done a walk across the U.S. since then. There are a lot more than you would think, and, uh, they uniformly have that same, that same reaction, that it was just an unbelievably um, kind of re reaffirming experience. Many people who aren't white. What's that? Many people who aren't white that have had that experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, most people who, ha who have, at least as far as I know, have been white, um, or probably for, you know, some sort of level of comfort that they fear, uh, feel. Uh, there, I, I did read a really great book recently called Planet Walker about this guy who, this black guy, during the 70s, um, 
he actually was kind of a gradual process. He gave up uh, using a car because of this oil spill in, in San Francisco Bay. And he said, I'm never, I'm never burning a drop of oil again, so I'm going to walk everywhere. Um, so he, he would walk everywhere. He decided to give up talking. Um, and he left from California. He walked, he walked across the U.S. over a period of a few years. He stopped and earned a, a master's degree and a Ph.D. without speaking along the way. Um, he eventually made it to D.C., I think. He, he got hired by uh, the Coast Guard um, because he had done this research in oil spills. Um, and uh, he, he eventually, decades later, started talking again. Um, but but he, he definitely had a, a, a tougher experience. Um, but, but he still made it safely and, and met a lot of you know, surprisingly kind people along the way as well. Well, this has been so much fun. Let's give a big round of applause for Becky Cooper and our special guests.